Please note that this will be recorded. And please note that this meeting will be recorded. If you have got any objection, please raise it up in the in the chat. Thank you. Okay, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Edson Campbell. I'm the co-organizer of Botswana Ara Users. Uh, so I welcome you to this meetup. Uh, this meetup is also being hosted by Botswana Ara and uh, sorry, the Bulawayo Ara and, and Eswatini Ara user group. Okay, so today we are, our guest is uh, Dr. Andrew Collier from Fatom Data. Yet. So he's going to be present to us, um, going to talk about his package, demonstrate to us this package called email. -y. So this package is, is about sending encrypted emails for direct from R. So we welcome you, uh, Dr. Andrew. Maybe you can start by introducing yourself and we'll give you the floor to start your presentation. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh, really great to be here and to be talking to you all. Can I? Can you see my screen? I'm assuming that's a yes. <laughs> yes, I can see it. I can see it from my side. Fantastic. Right. So. Email is a really old technology. It's um, been around in its present form, I guess, since the, the 1970s. And not an awful lot has changed since then. It's, um, it's very stable, it's robust, and it's, it's reliable. And one might reasonably ask the question, um, in light of all the other ways that we now have to communicate, like Slack and Telegram and WhatsApp, is email still actually relevant? And I would stay, say without any hesitation that email most certainly is still relevant. And there are a number of reasons for that. The first is that it's really pervasive. Um, there's an enormous number of emails that have been sent every single day. It's accessible. Almost everybody has access to email. So even if you can't get onto Slack or you don't have WhatsApp or Telegram for that matter, most people can get email. And thirdly, it's very versatile. And what I mean by that is that you can use email to communicate a wide range of different content. So you can just send text, you can send HTML, you can attach images, you can attach movies. Essentially, anything can be dumped into an email. So good morning, I'm Andrew Collier. I am from South Africa and uh, I moved across the UK <clears throat> midway through 2021. Um, I'm interested in a bunch of uh, different tech and you can see uh, R and Python are amongst those. Um, I'm, I'm also a very keen runner. I, I like being outdoors. I've recently developed a, a passion for collecting mushrooms. I work for a company called uh, Fathom Data, which is a small fully remote data science uh, consulting company based in South Africa, but actually uh, with people working um, globally. So we've got um, someone in Estonia, I'm here in the UK, and we've got someone else um, in Sweden. But the bulk of our operation is actually still located in South Africa. And we work with clients uh, throughout Africa, in Europe, Australia, and, and the United States. And we, in addition to sort of a very wide range of, of data science tasks, we do a lot of automated reporting. And for that purpose, email is by far our preferred medium. And because of that, we started developing our, our own internal package uh, called Emaili. Uh, the name is a misspelling of the Zulu word for email. And the initial design goals for this package were that it should ideally work with all SMTP servers and that it should require no complicated dependencies. Um, and if, if you've had trouble installing our Java uh, to support one of the other email packages, 
then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to be doing a, a little demonstration towards the, the end of this talk. Um, and during that presentation, I'll be, I mean, during that demonstration, I'll be sending out a, a demonstration email. If you would like to receive that email, then I would love it if you would just sign up um, just by entering your email uh, address and your name on the, the form that you'll find uh, at this link. And I believe this link has also been included in the chat, so you don't have to worry about scribbling it down. You can just head over to the chat and Zoom and you'll have access to that, that URL. I'd really appreciate you providing me with that email address. I promise not to abuse that email address by uh, spamming you subsequently. I will honor that. So um, given the fact that there are a bunch of different email packages available for R already, one might very reasonably ask the question, do we need yet another email package? And now this, is a, this is a great question. Um, and, and I think that, that I have good answers for that. Firstly, Emaili works on all of the SMTP servers that we have tried it on. It doesn't have any complicated dependencies. It's being actively developed. So we are um, maintaining the package and adding new features all the time. It works well with a sort of a modern R workflow. In other words, it integrates well with the pipe, both the, the deployer pipe and uh, the, the new uh, built-in pipe in R. And then it has a few uh, new features, encryption, markdown, and templates. And those are the ones that I'm gonna be talking about specifically today. But before I talk, talk about those new features, what I'd like to do is just run you through the process of sending a basic email with emaili. So before we do that, let's consider what the components are for an email, or for that matter, a, a simple conventional letter. And to my mind, there are three components. So there's the envelope. And this is essentially the, the wrapper that contains the message. And you'll see that in an email message, there is a direct uh, analog to, to the envelope. And that is that the header, which essentially um, provides information about who is going to be the recipient of the email, who the sender is, and what the subject is. And then you've got the letter itself, which of course goes into the envelope. And this is going to be the, the content of the email. And then finally, you've got the delivery system, which for um, conventional letter would be the post office. Um, but in the case of email, that's going to be a SMTP server and, and a network of other servers that basically pass the message from the, the sender ultimately to, to the recipient. So we need to mirror these three components in code. And I suppose the most fundamental component of this is, is an address, right? You, you can't send a message unless you have a, a recipient. And we have an a, a, abstraction for that in emaili and this is the the address object and creating a, an address object is done by simply calling the address constructor and th there is a, a a mandatory argument for this and that is the actual email address to which you are sending the email but you can also optionally provide a, a display name or a friendly name uh, corresponding to that address Equally, you can call the as address helper function, which will take uh, an email address, which is in the format that you would normally see it in, in your email client with uh, the display name and then the actual email address and angle braces, and will convert it into an, an address object. And once you've then created this address object, you can print it, of course, and see that its rendered content then contains both the the display name as well as the actual email address. Okay, so we, we've got a way of, of addressing um, the people involved and the parties. Next, we need to create the, the envelope object. And of course, this is done with uh, the envelope function. And this will create the, the container for your message. And you can immediately in the constructor for the envelope object, provide the, the name of uh, the recipient as well as the person who's sending the, the message. Equally, you can provide an, an empty envelope. So an envelope just blank with no content or nothing written on the outside. And then you can 
add the recipient and add the from address by using methods on that envelope object. And the result of this is that when you render it in R, in R or R Studio, you get something that looks like this in the image at the bottom of the slide uh, that has a date. So the date at which the, the envelope or the object was created, a to field, so who the message is going to, and a from field, who's originating the message. And you'll see that, that there's a, another field in here, the X mailer, which is really um, just for internal development purposes. This allows me, if people have issues working with email, to just see exactly which version of, of the package they're working with. Now, in addition to the, the to and the from fields, you probably also want to provide a subject. And this can be done by using the subject argument in the constructor to the envelope object, or alternatively, just by calling the, the subject method and providing an argument. And this ultimately then becomes the, the subject of your email message. OK, so that's got the envelope sorted, the stuff that you'd see on there, the outside of your letter. What about the actual contents? Well, there are a couple of approaches to actually filling out the body of, of the email. You can take a, a, sim a super simple approach and just use the text method, in which case uh, text content, raw text is going to be injected into the email. And you can see that this is simply appended after the, the header of the email. Or alternatively, if you want to be a little bit more sophisticated, maybe producing an, an email that looks more attractive, then you can use the HTML method. And in this case, you can actually write uh, HTML code as the argument. And this will then be transferred across into the email body. You will see that there's a little bit that happens in the background here. And that is that our, our simple paragraph tag gets wrapped in a body tag and an HTML tag just to make it a complete HTML document. And the result of this is that in the email client, of the recipient, the message will just look a little bit more attractive. All right, so we've got the body of the email sorted out. Now the final component is actually delivering that email. So somehow we have to take this, this message and send it. And that is done by setting up a, a server object. Uh, and this is done by calling the server function. And here we have to provide some information about the, the server. And here, for example, I'm configuring a server that's going to be using the Gmail SMTP server, specifying a port uh, on that server, and then a username and password. Because for the vast majority of SMTP servers, you need to provide some sort of uh, authentication details and credentials. And I'm going to get these both uh, from my environment variables, which helps me to not have to worry about uh, injecting my credentials directly into, into any of the scripts that I write. Now, this server function actually returns a closure, and that closure captures those credentials. It also captures the, the details of the, the um, SMTP server. And we can then use that closure as a function uh, to dispatch our, our message. Okay, so you just then call the closure with uh, the, the message object that we created earlier. Um, and that will then send the message off. You can get detailed logging from the process uh, by including this verbose argument. And this can be very useful if you're having issues actually establishing a connection with your uh, SMTP server. It allows you to debug just exactly what's going on. And this connection, actually, once, once you've established a connection to the SMTP server, this will be uh, persistent, and you can reuse this connection then a number of times, and this will actually speed up subsequent messages that you're sending via the same server. And this can be useful if you're sending a whole series of, of emails to uh, different people. And finally, this um, closure actually uh, implements exponential backoff. And what this means is that if your connection to the server is dodgy in any way, then it will retry a number of times with progressively greater delays uh, until it actually manages to, to send that message. OK, so this seems like a good place to have our, our first demo. And this is going to be a super simple demo. We're just going to send a plain vanilla uh, message. And what we're going to do is we're going to send this via uh, SMTP bucket. 
Uh, SMTP bucket is not actually a real SMTP server, but it's a website that essentially allows you to send out uh, test emails, um, which is very, very useful for me while developing uh, the package. So let's just, I'm gonna make this slightly bigger. There we go. Um, let's just dissect the script for a moment. Uh, I'm loading up the emaili package. I'm then setting up my server, providing the, the host name, so SMTP bucket, the port, uh, and, and a fictitious username. You'll see in just a moment that we can create arbitrary uh, email addresses that, that we can use as, as usernames, uh, and then creating uh, an envelope object. So we're sending it to Bob, and we're saying that the message is coming from Jenny. And we can literally use anyone's email address here. It doesn't matter because we're not actually really sending an email. Providing a subject and then a text body for the message. And then finally dispatching the method. And I'm going to just run that whole script now. And there we go. And you can see, right, I had verbose logging on and that means that I am able to see the communications with the server. So this is um, us connect, connecting to the server and you can see here negotiating the initial connection, ultimately sending the message and then we're done. And what we can do now is pop across to SMTP bucket and I'm going to just drag another window into view. All right, so you should now see SMTP buckets. And I'm going to just say that I'm looking for messages sent by Jenny at google.com. Search for those. And there we go. So at 929, that's UTC, a message was sent from Jenny to Bob. And you can see that there are a number of these messages have been sent historically while I was setting up this talk. We can click through on the test message and there we can see the, the body of the message which mirrors what we actually created um, in, back here in R. Okay, so that's kind of the, the workflow involved here. And this is very handy to use SMTP bucket because it means I don't actually really need to worry about uh, working with an actual server. Okay, so first demo done. This means that we can go back to actually talking about the, the interesting stuff. And, and those are those new features in, in Emaili. And the first one that we're going to be talking about is encrypted email. And I, I'm very excited about this, um, principally because the idea of sending secret messages is something that's appealed to me ever since I was a kid. And I now have the ability to send real, strongly encrypted um, messages um, anytime I want. But I was interested to know just exactly how pervasive uh, the use of encryption uh, was in, in emails. And uh, so I launched a little Twitter poll to which you, I got the astronomical response of 25 votes. So I'm not going to claim for a moment that this, that this result is statistically representative. But I think that it is certainly suggestive of the fact that the majority of people never encrypt their emails. So roughly 70% don't even consider encryption. Around 20% of people do, and 10% roughly do so all the time. So definitely um, the minority of people are actually frequently uh, encrypting their messages. And so I asked the question, well, why not? Well, I suppose that one aspect of, of this is that getting it all set up, enabling email encryption is, is a bit of a problem. The, the other side, and I think that this is probably um, the more uh, important reason, is that most of the people that you communicate with uh, don't actually have uh, encryption set up. And, and of course, it requires both parties to have encryption set up in order to make this work. Um, so there, there are some ways around this. So rather than kind of baking your own solution or configuring your own machine to send encrypted email, you could use a, a commercial service like Hushmail, for example. And you can see, well, you can get a subscription to Hushmail for um, uh, somewhere in the, around, in the region of 10 uh, US dollars per month. And, and I suppose in the greater scheme of things, it's not terribly expensive. But if you compare it to the cost of Gmail, 
free, then relatively speaking, it is. So in my mind, uh, if you're interested in using encrypted email, then it's definitely worth your while to get it set up on, on your own machine. So why would we want to actually use uh, encrypted email? And my thinking on this is, well, Big Brother is always watching you. And even if you have nothing to hide, there's certainly nothing to lose from being cautious, right? There's no reason that other people should have access to the messages that you're sending, be those um, business messages or messages about the research you're doing or simply messages to your mom. So what are the things that one can do with um, encryption uh, in, in the context of emails? Well, the first thing is you can sign a message. And this is a very useful thing because it means that you're essentially validating that the message is indeed coming from you. And the other thing, and I think this is the more obvious one, is that you can secure a message. And this ensures that only the valid recipient can read that message. So if that message falls into anyone else's hands, then they shouldn't be able to access the contents. And if the contents of that message are in any way sensitive, then this can be super important. Okay, so let's just take a look at what the, the typical sort of workflow would be for sending an encrypted email. And what we do is start off with a message. So one of the messages that, that you saw me create very uh, quickly and easily with email earlier, then you have the option of signing it. So you can, or, but you don't have to sign it. And you finally have the option of, of encrypting it. And this series of events is important. The fact that signing happens before encrypting is significant because this also means that if you both sign and encrypt, then your signature is going to be encrypted as well. And you'll, you'll see what I'm, I'm talking about in just a moment while we, when we actually dig into how this works in practice. Okay, so if you decided that you wanted to use either one of these technologies in Emaili, then this is how you'd go about doing that. So you would take the message that we created earlier and you would pipe it into the encrypt function or the encrypt method. And by default, this would both sign and encrypt the message. So in other words, it would validate that you created that message and it would uh, encrypt the contents so only the recipients are able to read it. However, there are optional arguments, sign and encrypt, and you can use these to toggle either one of those uh, functions on or off. So for example, you could sign but not encrypt, or alternatively, you could encrypt but not sign. All depends on just exactly what you're aiming to achieve. So let's have a look at what this actually does to the contents of, of your email. So supposing that we were aiming to just sign a message. So our unsigned message would look like this. Whoops. We've got the, the header, right? So the basically the metadata about the message and then the message contents. And of course, this is plain text. So it means that anyone can read the contents of this method, but at the same time, there's no way that we can validate that Bob was the person who actually generated this message. If however, Bob signs this message, then indeed we can, uh, provided that we have Bob's uh, public key. So what does the, the operation of signing actually do to this message? Well, after we've signed it, the structure of the message looks something like this. So we go from a simple message that looks like so to essentially a hierarchical message that has a variety of different sort of layers and, and content. Um, so you can see, for example, here on the outside, it's a multi-part signed MAM container. And you can see there's the multi-part signed and that wraps a, a multi-part mixed components. So here's the multi-part mixed. And inside that you've got some text plane. So there's the text plane component. And this is the, the, the plain text content of the message. So there you go. There's our original method, message, right? There's no encryption taking place here. So our meth message is still fully readable to anyone. But then the key component here is the, the application 
PGP, signature components of message, which is this last bit down here. And there, the key element is this PGP signature. And this is the content that validates the, the sender. So this essentially allows us to be confident that Bob was the person who wrote this text. And if you think about you know, sending a, a legal document, then being able to sign that message when you send the document is really useful because it validates that you are the actual uh, the originator of that document. Okay, so what about now encrypting that message? Well, if we choose to just encrypt, but not sign, then we we'll once again end up with a, a, a MIME structured message um, that has multiple components. And the, the key component for us is this, which is now the, the encrypted content of that message. And if you look carefully here, that plain text content that we had in the original message has now vanished, right? Because that text is now wrapped up in this encrypted blob. And I think that if you just eyeball that, you'll realize that that is pretty dense and impenetrable. And of course, it's like you, you actually would have to work very, very hard to, to decrypt that or to crack that. But if you, uh, if you are the person to whom this message is addressed, then you'll have the corresponding private key and you'll be able to open up that message effortlessly. Of course, you can also sign and encrypt, in which case the message looks very much like much the same, but the contents of the, the encrypted component has now got a little bit bigger. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, when you sign and encrypt, your signature is also encrypted. So this encrypted blob now contains not only the original message, uh, but also that signature that we saw a couple of slides back. Okay, so let's take a look at how this actually works. And I'm gonna pop back to our studio. And here's my script with uh, encryption. And so what I'm gonna do is firstly load up the, the GPG library. This is actually not strictly necessary, but it enables me to call this GPG restart function. The reason that I've included these in the script is because when I was putting this all together, I was playing around with a variety of different um, key pairs. And I wanted to just ensure that whenever I ran the script, I ended back up using my, my default key pair. Um, normally, you wouldn't have to include either that or this in your script. Loading up Emaili and then configuring a, a server. And, and in this case, I'm pulling all of these details again from my environment. And if I just evaluate this, then you'll see that the, the server I'm using is the Gmail SMTP and my username, that's gonna be just my default username. And of course, I'm not gonna show you my password, but that's also been pulled through from the environment. So I'm gonna run all of those commands right now just to get my server set up. And then we're gonna create our message, right? Our message is going to be sent from me to me. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have a subject, which is gonna be top secret message. And then something that I probably would want to encrypt, right? If you're sending a, an email to someone and you're sending them a password, that password may be to a new email account or to a database or to a server, then you'd want to secure that and ensure that no one else can get access to it. Um, but if we just create this message as it stands and take a look at it, well, that message content is plain text. So if we sent this as, as it stands, then anyone between me and the recipient could actually see the content and would have access to that, um, that password. So what we can do is apply the encrypt method to that message. And if we take a look now, we'll see, aha, uh -huh, I've got to provide my passphrase. Okay, so that's just a way of locking up my private key. And now if I take a look at that message, we'll see that I can no longer see my password because that has all been wrapped up in that great big encrypted blob. 
So let's now send that using the Gmail SMTP server. And there you go. So you can see the interactions with the server, setting up the connection and then sending the message. And now to actually prove this all works, let's pop across to my email client. There we go. There's my top secret message. And you can see there is the, the decrypted content. Now this is decrypted because I've got my email client set up to, to, use, um, my, to use encryption. And I can go and interrogate this by going and clicking on this button over on the right hand side here. And you can see here that it says uh, the message is encrypted and with this encrypt, uh, encryption key and that it's signed and that it's a good digital signature. So this basically validates um, that indeed the message did come from, from me. And to just validate that the underlying content is actually encrypted. If I go and have a look at the source, which is the content that was actually delivered to my email client, there we go, the encrypted message. So this is what anybody else would see if they actually intercepted this message uh, between the sender and the recipient. Only the person with the, the associated private key would be able to decrypt the message and see the underlying content. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you about the encryption feature. Let's take a look at the, the next feature, which I'm very enthusiastic about, um, principally because it allows me to easily create uh, attractive um, email messages without having to go to a whole lot of effort and write uh, a bunch of, of HTML. So why? Well, HTML emails do look a lot nicer than plain text messages. Uh, and in addition, HTML allows you to do things like uh, injecting an image uh, into a, a message. You can't do that with plain text. However, on the downside, HTML is a lot more difficult to write than text, right? You've got to worry about inserting all of those tags and you've got to have attributes on those tags and you have to have the closing tags. It's a bit of a headache, right? Well, fortunately we have Markdown, which comes to the rescue. Uh, and Markdown really comes in two flavors. You have plain Markdown, uh, which is essentially just a, a language that can be transformed into HTML. And then there's R Markdown, uh, which is, like plain Markdown, but also has this ability to uh, introduce code uh, chunks. And those code chunks can be evaluated in R and they can be used to dynamically generate content, which is then rendered into the resulting document. So I wanted to be able to include both plain Markdown as well as R Markdown in, in my documents. So let's answer the first question. Can we render plain Markdown? directly into an email. And indeed we can do this with emaili. How is that done? Well, with the, the render function and the first argument to that is either a string with plain markdown or alternatively the name of a file containing markdown. And here we can see that in that markdown string, I've got the double asterisks on either side of awesome. And in the rendered results, so my actual email, you can see that the simple string has now been transformed into an HTML document. You can see it opens up with the HTML tag, but more importantly, the markdown has transformed these double asterisks into a strong tag. And this means that in the resulting message, this word awesome is going to be in boldface. Okay. so. I think that's that's fairly cool, um, but I, I want to use this for automated reporting and, and a typical automated reporting workflow for us would look like something along the lines of, okay, I'm going to go and retrieve some data from a database or an API. I'm then going to use that data to generate something. It might be a table, it may be a visualization, and, and I'd like all of that to be wrapped up and injected into an email. And this of course can be done using our markdown. And I would like, I mean, on the one hand, I could do this kind of in the manual way where I could 
write a markdown document. I could render that markdown document and then I could take the resulting HTML and include that into my email. But that's, that's just a whole lot of steps, right? I would like to be able to just go straight from markdown directly to email. And so that's what we ultimately implemented. So just for the purposes of, of demonstration, I've got a very simple R Markdown document where I have specified some header information, so the title and the output type. For the purposes of, of Emaili, this is always going to be an HTML document. And then I have a little bit of executable content here. So a, um, a code chunk, and that code chunk just simply uh, calculates an approximation to, to pi. Now, if I provide that file, so pi.rmd, as the argument to, to render, then what happens behind the scenes is that the emaili package will go and render that markdown document and include the results into um, the, the email. And you can see that my, my HTML content now is a little bit more elaborate than it was before. But if you look really carefully, then you'll see over here, we've got a pre-tag which contains the original code, so 22 divided by seven. And then on the following line, another pre-tag, which actually contains the result, which was calculated by R. So this is a very sort of simple and kind of a nonsense demonstration. I think it would make a lot more sense if we had a more real world demonstration of just exactly how this works. And I have one of those for you. Um, my thinking here is that it would be quite fun to have a, a demo in, in which I put together a script that would create a, a small report for uh, cryptocurrencies. And let's maybe start off with the markdown file. So this is what the markdown file is looks like. Uh, and you can see that it starts like most our markdown files. Important to point out here that it has a parameter defined uh, called symbol. And that symbol by default is going to be uh, Bitcoin uh, USDT. And then I enter into the actual body of, of the R Markdown document, pulling in some libraries, uh, defining a variable symbol upper, uppercase from that parameter, and then some text content where we in, create a timestamp, and then a code chunk which goes and retrieves some data from an API using the, the Binance package. So it's going to go to the Binance API, retrieve the, the data for that particular symbol. So by default, Bitcoin USDT, and then generate a plot and uh, create a, another plot. So basically we got to have a markdown document that's going to consist of, of two two plots. If I just render this directly, take some moment or two because it has to go and retrieve that data. And let's go and have a look at what that looks like. Oh, where's that going to be opened? Here we go. So that's what our <clears throat> markdown report looks like if I just render it in our studio. And what I'm wanting is for that content to be injected directly into an email. And so here's the, the driver script for doing precisely that. Once again, pulling in a, a few libraries, uh, creating a variable with uh, the markdown document name. So the one that we were just looking at a moment ago, creating an, an, another file name by just uh, transforming the RMD extension to HTML. And you're going to see why I'm doing that in just a moment. Setting up the SMTP server and creating a, a blank message object with uh, the sender and the recipient specified. So let's run that code. Um, and now I'm going to take sort of the, the old school approach and that is to simply render the, docu uh, render the markdown, create an HTML file, and then attach that HTML file onto my, my message object. So firstly, rendering it. So taking that R markdown and transforming it into an HTML document. So here you can see that it's created this HTML document. And then with my message object, I'm going to just attach that onto it. And, and then finally send that off uh, via my server. If I do that, 
and head over to my email clients. See, there's the messages arrived already. But unfortunately, the, the, mess, the actual HTML is in an attachment. And somewhat irritatingly, if I then try and just open this attachment directly from my email client, it doesn't work. So I've got to now save this onto my disk. And once I've saved it on the disk, I can then open it up in my browser. And then I can finally view the, the contents. And this is this is a little bit too much resistance, I think. Uh, you know, if you're sending a, 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 an automated report daily, um, the recipients are going to get tired of this process of saving and then opening that HTML report uh, every day. Ideally, you want them to be able to view that content immediately, directly in their email client. Um, so let's see if we can make that happen. Uh, let's go back to our script then. And what we're going to do is send it to just a single recipient, that's me, uh, and just for one symbol. And what I'm doing here is taking advantage of the fact that we set up our markdown document with this uh, parameter. So by default, it's going to give us a report for uh, Bitcoin versus uh, USDT. But because this is a parameterized markdown document, we can choose a different symbol. Right? So now I'm going to send it to myself. But now I'm going to be looking at uh, Ethereum versus USDT. And rather than rendering the document directly uh, within RStudio, I'm going to use the, the render method from Emaili and render directly into, into email. So let's run that. Behind the scenes, what's happening is that uh, R is going and actually rendering that document, um, pulling data for this uh, crypto pair. And I see that I have received an email. So now I see that I've got my crypto report for Ethereum USDT. And here is the content, like readily available for me to view in my email client. So there's no extra friction associated with saving and then opening that document. It's visible right here. And you can see that because we changed um, the symbol, we've now got a report for a different currency pair. So this immediately means that you can start doing things like running this over uh, repeatedly for a variety of different symbols and potentially sending those different reports to different people. So let's take a look at how that might be done. So what I've now done is set up a small data frame, data frame or a triple, and that has got uh, three columns in it. So the first is a name. So that's me using my work address and me using my personal address. Then the second column is the actual addresses. So right, that's my work email. That's my personal email. And then finally, the symbol uh, that I'm interested in. So Ripple and... Right, and then I've got, I'm employing the, the walk, pwalk function from the per package and essentially then just iterating this over each of the records in this data frame. So what I would expect is to get a report for this pair being sent to that address and for this pair being sent to this address. So we can run that and take a look. Okay, it's got a, that's generating the first report and generating the second report. And we can now pop back to my email clients and see, right? So there's the, the report for that currency being delivered to my, my work address. And if I go across to my personal address, we see here, their report for the other currency pair being sent to the other address. So this, with this kind of structure in place, it means that you can essentially have like a, a table of um, different recipients and different symbols, uh, and you can send off a report to different people, uh, and you can do this daily, right? You can automate the entire process. And of course, this table with uh, recipients and uh, symbol pairs, this could be included in a spreadsheet, but equally it could be something that you'd maintain in a database. Okay, so 
Uh, let's look on at the, the third topic now, which is message templates. And I was just I wanted to point out that these these two things, like using Markdown and using templates, are, are um, featuring now very heavily in our automated reporting uh, workflow because we can really do a lot in terms of sending out these messages to um, well messages that are customized to individuals, and we can send them out uh, to a very wide range of of people very easily. Okay, so. What are these templates all about? Well, you, you might have noticed that those messages that I sent out uh, rendering the R Markdown documents, think they looked really nice. And, and I'm a big fan of sort of the default appearance of R Markdown documents, but they all, they all kind of look like our markdown documents. Uh, it would be very nice if we had um, some more flexibility about the, the, the contents of, of these messages. And this is where templates come into, into the picture. Um, so templates uh, give us the ability to essentially create a, a really sophisticated um, message and they require a bit more work because you could actually have to write some, some native HTML, but they're also very much more flexible in the sense that you can include anything uh, into the template body. So I'm going to build up to uh, the, the implementation of, of the template feature uh, in a number of steps. So let's start off with uh, a message that has some hard-coded content in it. So I've got my message object and I add to that an HTML document. And the contents of that uh, document is simply a, a hard-coded string. It says, hi, Bob. And when I send off that message, you can see there's my HTML body. It does precisely what I wanted to or what I specified, right? It's sending a message that has the contents, hi, Bob. But it's completely inflexible in the sense that, well, if I want to send this message to Alice, and I need to go and actually change the contents of the, the document from Bob to Alice. So the, the next logical step here is to use uh, content interpolation. So I'm still using the, the HTML function, but now rather than hard coding the name Bob, into the content, I have the, the variable name, uh, the variable name, and that variable has been assigned the value Bob. And here I've got these curly braces, which indicates that the, the contents are going to be interpolated. In other words, something's going to be happening behind the scenes in which this name variable is going to be substituted for its value. And this is implemented using the, the very cool uh, glue package. And if you've worked with the glue package before, then you might notice that I'm using the double braces rather than the, the single braces. And this is basically just for consistency with the syntax that I'm using uh, in templates as, as well. And you can see that the result of this is that I still get precisely the same message as before, but now I have the ability to very easily change the contents of that message. If I wanted to send something that said, hi, Alice, I would simply change the contents of the name variable from Bob to Alice. All right. The next step up, of course, is okay, well, having to write HTML and include these tags, well, that can be a bit of a pain. So maybe I can just render a markdown document. And indeed, this can be done again by using interpolation. So we can interpolate variables directly into a markdown document. And again, we end up with the same message, hi, Bob. Um, but just a little bit easier now because we don't have to worry about the tags. And we can make this super flexible. As you would have seen in the last demonstration, our markdown documents can have parameters. So we can make a, a parameterized message as well and use the params argument to, to render to um, flexibly change the contents of, of our email. Uh, message. But using templates and specifically uh, templates uh, implemented using the, the Jinja template uh, language, which is something that I believe originally came from the Python world, we are able to, to create a, a template with um, some content that can be very easily substituted uh, from, from code and gives us a wide a degree of flexibility in, in determining just exactly what goes into, into our, our documents. So in the very simplest case, what you would have is a separate template file 
like this, which you can see literally contains an HTML document, but embedded in that HTML document is some uh, Ginger templating. And you will see this is exactly the same syntax that we saw earlier with the, the content interpolation. So this is basically saying, I'm expecting that there's going to be a variable called name, and I'm going to take the value of that variable uh, called name and inject it over here. And to use this in Emaili, we would call the template method, providing it with the name of a template. And this greeting tells Emaili that it needs to look in a greeting folder for a file called templates.html. And the reason for this folder structure is that ultimately I'm wanting to have the ability of presenting different templates with the same name. So for example, I would like uh, to have a, a text version of the greeting template as well as an HTML version. Because I think this would just give me a lot more flexibility in terms of the, the nature of the emails that I send. So after you've specified the name of the template, you can then specify one or more uh, parameters. And those parameters are then used to, to fill out the body of the template. And if we look at the resulting document here, we can see there is our HTML body. And once again, the name has been substituted with the, the value Bob that we provided uh, when we ran the, the template method. Now, why? Why would we want to use templates rather than uh, uh, markdown and uh, the content interpolation that I showed you just a moment ago. Well, templates, uh, in addition to giving us access to, to variables, also have these very cool features. So you can create a template document with a whole bunch of comments. And, and I use this liberally because I don't necessarily remember after the fact what my design considerations were. So having comments is really useful. We can do loops and conditionals. Now you might think that, well, we can do loops and conditionals in an R markdown document. And this is absolutely true. However, those are always going to be embedded inside a, a code chunk of some variety. Now, this is great, um, but what if you want to have some sort of um, a looping flow or a conditional that's not in a code chunk, right? Using a simple R markdown, this is going to be really difficult. However, using templates, it's very straightforward. There are also other features like inheritance and inclusion, which to be honest, I haven't really explored yet, but I think they have a lot of potential for enabling cool features. And when should we rather use a template versus markdown? Well, very often markdown is quite sufficient. And in that case, I would certainly say markdown is the route to take. Um, but templates are going to win out when you're not actually using any code. So in other words, you're creating a document that doesn't actually require you to have code chunks in it. You just want to have some logic, but no code. Um, if you want to use control structures, right? So in other words, control structures directly, um, control structures that, again, don't involve running code. And finally, if you want to have some sort of flexible um, HTML or CSS structure. If, you, if you're rendering an R Markdown document, then the layout of that Markdown document is going to, well, so the layout of the rendered HTML document is always going to look roughly the same. Um, but if you are using the template approach, then you have complete control over the structure of that, that document. Okay, so what can you actually do with these templates? Well, I'm very, very glad that you asked or that you're thinking about that. And you know, there are a number of applications, but the one that immediately comes to my mind is that it would be very easy to implement something like MailChimp. Right? MailChimp is a phenomenal service, and, and I think that what it provides me when I use it is the ability to use one of their templates uh, to create a message that's very aesthetically appealing and where I can customize the contents and send it to a variety of, of different people. So essentially people from a, an email list. Well, using the templating feature in Emaili, you can do all of this. All you need to do is create the templates. And of course, because you're writing the template yourself, you have complete control over just exactly what goes into that template. And once you've got the template in place, 
you can then um, send it off to whoever you want. Um, and you, of course, have complete management or complete control over your email list. You don't have to hand that over to MailChimp either. OK, so final demo. And I, I know that I've been talking for quite a long time now. I'm almost done. This is my last demo. Uh, and then I'll be very happy to ask any questions you might have. Let's flip over to this. Um, I'm going to take a look at the scripts in just a moment, but let's take a look at the at the template first. This is what the template looks like. So it's a HTML document. It's got um, a, a header chunk, and in this, I'm pulling in the the font awesome CSS library. I'm going to use that to to render some uh, icons, and then. I, I start writing the actual the body of my message. And you can see that this looks a lot more like HTML, but it's got some templating injected into it as well. So I've got some code here, which basically checks whether I have defined a name. And if I have defined a name, then you're going to see hi followed by the name. So hi, Bob, for example. But if I haven't defined a name, then not only are you not going to get the name included in the resulting message, but you're also not going to get the space. Now, if you are highly OCD, then like me, then having a message that's high space exclamation mark can be really irritating. So my thinking here is if I don't have a, a, a calling name for this person, then rather than having a high space exclamation mark, I just want to have high exclamation mark. Um, OK, and then just scrolling a little bit further down here is and so that this was an illustration of using a conditional in a template. And here is an example of using a, a loop in a template. So I'm going to provide a list of packages and the template is going to loop over that list and it's going to create um, some list elements listing each one. So I, in, in the resulting message, I'm going to be pointing you to a couple of, of my packages. And then finally pulling in uh, an, an image at the end of the message. Okay, let's see what the, the resulting driver script or the associated driver script looks like. Pulling in a couple of packages. I've got a flag that indicates whether or not I'm debugging. What this debugging flag does is it really just targets only the first email address in my, um, in my spreadsheet. Um, you would have all seen the, the spreadsheet of names. So these are the people that have signed up for uh, receiving this demo. Thank you very much for taking part. So what I'm going to do here is simply pull in the contents of that spreadsheet. And that's going to be my data. And then setting up the server. I'm creating my list of packages. Remember that in the templates, I'm wanting to iterate over these packages and list them in the body of the email. So they're not explicitly listed here. So here I'm going to point you to my Binance package and my file bin package. And then this is once again taking advantage of the pwalk function from per to iterate over each of the records um, in that spreadsheet and send off a message to, to each one of them. So Let's run that. And this is going to start sending off messages. So there's the first one that's going to me. I think the first three are all going to me at different email addresses. Uh, and then I'll be sending out to, to the rest of you lovely people who've chosen to take part. And if I go back to my clients, there we go. Here's the message that's come in. There we go. Here's the contents. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for attending my talk. Here's the, the list of packages, right? So you can see that, that the template has actually expanded that list. And then finally, we've got that image at the end. And here you can see it's hi, Andrew. And if I go across to my other account, and here is the other message, right? Hi, Andrew again. Uh, that's because I spent specified Andrew as the calling name in both of those. OK, so that's the final demo. I think I can now wrap this up. Um, where does email -y work well? Well, I like to say that it works pretty well everywhere. So standalone R scripts works nicely in R Studio. I've tested it quite extensively in Shiny apps and it plays well there too. A lot of our applications that we're writing uh, are going to be containerized. So they're wrapping up, wrapped up in a Docker image and deployed um, most, most commonly on ECS. Um, so email -y works in that context really well. 
Um, we've used them in GitHub Actions and also CI on GitLab. It's performed well in all of those contexts. So finally, I would just like to conclude with my thoughts on this and that I think that, that email is still a really useful um, and fundamental way of communicating information, especially if you've got a variety of different document types that you need to attach. And yes, if you would like to grab the content associated with this talk, you'll find it at this URL. Um, the slides are there as well as all the, the demo scripts. Um, if you run into any hassles with running the demo scripts, please get in touch. Uh, and also please reach out on uh, Twitter and, and LinkedIn. My handle is uh, datawiki um, on both of those. And I'd be really uh, keen to, to connect with you and engage really around all things related to um, R and Python and data. So yeah, at this stage, if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to, to answer them. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Before we start asking questions, we would like to take a picture. Um, may people come on their videos. I think we should on. Oh, yeah, there we go. My camera's broken, so I'll just leave it as Python Ireland. I think I've taken two shots. Okay. Thank you very much. So we can now proceed and ask questions. Pondi. Yes, Pondi, ask. Uh, uh, hello. Thank you so Hi. much for the... Thank you so much for the presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, are you going to send the slides? Want to go through the tutorial? Yep, absolutely. So um, that there's the link. You can download them right now. Um, otherwise, I, I think that um, we can provide those. We can send them to you. I can actually just pop this URL into the chat now. Uh, let's do that. And then you can go and grab those things immediately. There you Thank go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great pleasure. Okay, Ahmadou. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation. Uh, really liked it. You know, um, I'm trying to explore also email, and particularly for my work, we are using a kind of, uh, we are in this uh, Microsoft universe, you know, so it's a business account with Azure and everything. And I think there is the Microsoft R365 package supporting both, I think, Emily and Blastula. I just tried with Blastula once it worked, but mm. never with Emily. So I think I will also do some testing. I wanted to know about branding because I think we we are working on some template for our markdown for our document, trying to push the possibility agenda. And I think um, I was quite impressed with the way you do your templates. So if you have any you know, pointers on how to also brand this template to have, a, for example, the logo, I mean, what you sent to us as email looks nice. So I just wanted to see because there is a way to brand our markdown. You have a lot of documentation now. Just wanted to know if I embark in trying to do the same with my ALE, you know, is there anything I can look for, you know, to just see how to play with CSS and all those things to have something, you know, branded for my, my organization. And last point, we just acquired a, a connect server and uh, automatizing you know, the, the process, uh, is there something we have to think about or it's just like playing with CI and CD as you've mentioned, so thank you. So many questions. Um, so to address the first one uh, regarding uh, integration with um, Microsoft 365, I, I did do a little bit of work on that um, some months ago, uh, but I haven't revisited it since. At that stage, it was working quite nicely. 
However, um, I'd be very happy to take feedback on that. So if you run into any issues uh, using it uh, within the Microsoft suite, just let me know and we'll iron those out. I'm very keen on getting it to work because I know that uh, there's certainly a large number of people who are kind of using the, the Microsoft uh, product suite. Um, secondly, with regards to branding, like this is something that we do routinely. You know, when we're sending out our, our reporting, we either got to be branding it with our own internal brand, so Fathom Data, or with the brand of our client. And you know, this using the templating approach, this can be very flexible because um, really anything that you can do on a web page, you can do with a template, right? So you got to have um, some CSS, you got to have the, the HTML content, you got to pull in the, the logos uh, and, and any other branding. So you can choose the colors, you can choose the fonts, you can choose the, the, the images that are going to go into your messages. And you know, so anything that you can do on um, one of your clients or one of your internal uh, web pages, you can then effectively send um, as, an, as an email message uh, via email. -y. And the final point was with regards to, to automation using Connect. This is a, another context that I haven't actually tested um, email in, and I would really like to be able to add that to the list of uh, places that email plays well. Um, but I do anticipate that really the, the, the automation is not going to be substantially different to, to what you would encounter in other scenarios like um, CI or actions. But again, uh, if you'd like to collaborate with me on, on getting that up and running, I'd be super happy to do that. So please just get in touch and we can make sure that it works. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I will definitely try and uh, we'll let you know how it goes. Thanks again for your presentation. Great pleasure. Thank you for attending. Any other question? Since there is no question anymore. No, just, just, just a quick one, if I may, not related to this one. You mentioned Hushmail for encryption. And um, is it working this? Um, and, I, and I missed the part because I was not here at the beginning, I think. And uh, so do we need, for example, um, a system or tools like like Hushmail or, or ProtonMail or something that works already with it, or because I okay no oh, okay. So, if you wanted to communicate with someone using encryption, what you would need to do is you would create your your own key pair. So you would create a, a private and a public key, uh, and you would then take your public key and share it with the other person, and they would do the same thing. They would also create a key pair and share their public key with you. And so when you were wanting to communicate with them, you would have their public key on your key ring. And so when you encrypt the message, it would be encrypted with their public key. And then since they are the only ones who possess their private key, they would only be the only ones who could then decrypt the message. And similarly, if you're signing the message, that signature is going to be done with your private key. And anyone else who has access to your public key can then use that public key to validate that the email does indeed originate from you. So there is a little bit of kind of uh, infrastructure setup required if you're wanting to use uh, encryption, but it really is, is very simple. Install uh, GPG and create a key pair. Like you can do that in, in two minutes and then you're ready to roll. The, the critical thing though is finding someone else to play with. And this is the source of frustration for me and that is that like you know there's only 10 percent of people who are routinely using encrypted email the vast majority of people that i correspond with aren't using encrypted email uh so you know the more people that you can get on board to to use encryption the more people you have to play with uh, yeah, thank you so much mr andrew it was very nice sessions uh, before this few days i was thinking that how to to do something new in R is like mail, but today is, is it was the day really I found the remarkable information from you. Thank you so much, Mr. Andy. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing this kind of sessions. Really, it's a good. Great pleasure. Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> there is a question on the chat from Vera. It says, How how do you define SMTP to Gmail server and to Outlook server? 
Oh, so you just need to, to get the, the URL for those, um, or so the, the DNS entry for those. So um, for, for Gmail, the uh, SMTP server is at smtp.gmail.com. Um, for, for Outlook, well, that all depends on, on what SMTP server you're using. So um, I, I'm guessing that if, if you're working from within a corporate environment, then your IT people will have set up an SMTP server and that's the one that you'd use. So you'd need to get from them the DNS entry as well as the port. Um, that's probably something that you can find that's configured within your email client. So you'd find that within the, the settings of your email client and you would use precisely those uh, in setting up your um, email email configuration as well. But generally, just you just need to ping the IT people and they'll be able to tell you exactly what it is. But for, for Gmail, it's simple. smtp.gmail.com uh, port 465 or 587. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, thank you, Andrew, for the excellent presentation. I'm already imagining how I can use this in my work, for example, because we also do workshops where we send feedback to people. So some will be accepted, some will be waitlisted, and some will be rejected. So, so from the Solana and XRP example, I can already say LinkedIn. But I was just wondering, so sometimes, and this is from a non-email encryption expert. Uh, uh, I do send emails and sometimes they get marked as spam. I was wondering if encryption is a way of getting past that or it's a different thing entirely. Yeah, that's a, that's a completely different question, I suppose. Um, I, I think that if, if you're sending messages from a legitimate domain, then you shouldn't have too much problems getting flagged as spam. But, you know, I think that it's also a function of, of the contents that you're, you're sending. So if there's a, an automated spam filter and the content that you're sending looks like spam, then you probably are going to get flagged. Um, but if, if you're sending something that's informative, um, you know, those filters are quite sophisticated nowadays. And, and I think that the false positive rate is relatively low. Good, thank you. Sure. Uh, there's uh, a question on the chat by Benson. He says, any suggestions for improving the email protocol? I'm not sure that I un completely understand the question. Um, you know, that I, I think that, that, that the email protocol works pretty well. It's, it's simple and it's robust. I don't have any sort of ideas for things that need to be fixed. Maybe there's some more specifics in the question from Benson. I guess it's answered. <laughs> I guess well, it's Benson. answered. Uh, any other question? Okay, I have so a question. Um, <laughs> I have a question for you, Andrew. Mm. Uh, if you've got a blog and people are, um, where you ask people to, to send messages, is it possible also to use email to sort of send back automated messages, something like that, hmm. from a blog post, something like that? I, I from your blog, why, sorry. I don't see why not. Um, well, I suppose that what, what you would need to do is if, if someone was like, if they, I guess it depends on how you're, you're taking messages on your blog. So I suppose that what you might do is have at the end of each of your blog posts, you may have some service that's integrated to allow people to type in messages. And I know there are a variety of different ones. So what you would need to do is be able to extract the contents of those email, the, those messages at least. And if the service that you're using as an API, then potentially what you could do is write an R script that would then go and retrieve the contents of those messages via the API. And you could then use uh, emaily to respond to those messages. But you know, that would rely on the fact that the people who, who posted uh, on your blog posts also provided their email addresses. Because you know, with, without those email addresses, you're not going to be able to correspond with them. But yes, I mean, depending on exactly how, how people are, co are commenting on your blog, I don't see why not. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's uh, one last question on the chat. 
uh, from Benz and curious if any issues have come up from your use of the package, for example, is there encryption, key exchange, uh, plain text versus HTML versus Markdown, et cetera? Well, a lot of issues have come up in the course of developing this package and it's been a, an enormous learning experience for me and I've, I've learned a lot more about email and how it works in the process. I think that um, in the case of, of, of encryption, one of the biggest challenges that I uh, mentioned this before is that you know not an awful lot of people are using encryption and you know your ability to send encrypted messages is limited by the number of public keys that you have. So if you don't have the public encryption key for someone, you can't send them an encrypted message. But this is relatively easily resolved. You, know, you just have to communicate with them and say, listen, I would like to send you an encrypted message. Can you please provide me with, um, with your public key? And then I suppose if they're sufficiently sophisticated to, to generate that key, they can send it back to you and then you can immediately start communicating with them using encryption. Um, with regards to issues with plain text versus HTML versus Markdown, well, the, the biggest challenge that I've had in, in that regard is actually getting um, HTML to render nicely in Gmail. And, and by that, I mean in the Gmail web client. Um, so I, I can send uh, an HTML email to myself using my Gmail account and read it in Thunderbird, which is my, the desktop email client that I'm using. Um, and that's a completely sort of seamless process. But if I want to read that in my Gmail web client, then things are a little bit more complicated because uh, Gmail is very particular about the CSS content uh, of HTML emails, as well as the, the way that images are injected into those HTML uh, documents. So a lot of the time and uh, sort of trial and error and experimentation uh, has, has involved making sure that the um, HTML messages, so both the ones that are like native HTML as templates and are markdown actually work um, in the Gmail web client. That's definitely the, been the most sort of challenging uh, recipient or challenging client in terms of getting those things to work. Um, thank you very much. Any other question? Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew, for sharing all of this information with us. We are very grateful. And to Great everyone pleasure. who attended, thank you. See you on the next meetup. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an honor to chat to you guys. And I really appreciate you sacrificing an hour and a half of your Saturday morning to, to be here. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Hindu. Thank you so much, all of you. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we're finished now. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was a very nice presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It was about twenty-two people at the maximum. Pretty good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And thank you, um, Kevin, for hosting us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. yeah have a good weekend, everyone. Okay. You too. All right. Don't forget to stop the recording. Oh yeah. Okay. I think we yeah. will close the record. We'll close the room now. Yeah, I'm gonna leave now. So I, I think uh, I'm gonna end the meeting now. So I, I think the recording stopped. No, the recording's still going. I'm gonna stop the recording. Yeah.